Hi, I'm Michelle Kunz. I hope you've seen some of my other EKG videos. Today we're going to talk about tachycardias. Now these are tachycardias on patients that have a pulse, but they might not be feeling so good. So we're going to um, observe them, check their monitored rhythm, and decide how to treat that. So there are a few tachycardias we need to talk about. There's atrial fibrillation, there's atrial flutter, there's SVT, and there's VTAC. Now, atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation, they may not be in a tachycardia, but it's good to recognize them and understand that they can become very fast rhythms. These are um, arrhythmias that originate in the atrium, and it's almost like this electricity continues to bombard the AV node trying to get down to the ventricle. The AV node blocks most of those beats. So the ventricular rate is based on how much electricity gets down through the AV node. So if you look at atrial fibrillation, I call it, it's a very chaotic baseline. And that is a lot of ectopic foci firing in the atrium. It's like a zillion little sinus nodes all around your atrium, firing all at one time, bombarding your AV node. The AV node, and it's, you know, repolarization and refractory periods going on here, only allows the ventricular electricity to come down as, as fast as possible, actually. And the rhythm can be very fast. If you were able to count your atrial rate, it's somewhere between 250 and 300 beats a minute. Good thing that the AV node blocks those beats from coming down. So you'll either have a controlled ventricular response, Slow is possible too, but we're concerned about the tachycardias that could result from this rhythm. The treatments that they usually do for this patient, besides oxygen, is also calcium channel blockers and Coumadin, because when your atrium is fibrillating, blood does sit and blood can clot. Atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter are the most common causes of stroke and other embolic problems. So atrial fib and atrial flutter can be very dangerous rhythms. Usually patients are stable with them. So we monitor them, we put them on medications, and there might be some more investigation, other drugs, even a trip to the cath lab with ablation therapy. So we'll always be monitoring these patients. Atrial flutter is a very similar rhythm to atrial fibrillation. It is one irritable foci firing rapidly in the atrium compared to multiple irritable foci in atrial fibrillation. Again, your AV node lets down the beats, could be slow, moderate ventricular response. It could also be very rapid. Same kind of treatments for this patient. Also in the tachycardia list, we have SVT, also known as supraventricular tachycardia, also called atrial tachycardias, usually arise from the atrium or it can actually even arise from around the AV node, and then it could be a junctional tachycardia. We'll look at that rhythm another time. But with SVT, it could be any of those areas firing so fast that your heart rate is now above 150. Even above 130, patients are very uncomfortable and can be unstable. So we want to recognize a rapid rhythm. And a rhythm that looks like this you might notice that there are narrow QRSs. Older people with bundle branch blocks, they might have wide QRSs. That gets a little tricky when identifying SVT because when you have a wide QRS that's going very rapid in a rate, it could also look like VTAC, which could be very scary for the patient and the professional caring for them. But let's deal with this SVT. We have a narrow QRS complex and we have beats in between the QRSs, which we might not be able to decipher. It could be a T wave, it could be P waves. It could actually be A fib and A flutter going very, very rapidly. So all you could see are the narrow QRSs. So when a rate is above 150 and we really can't determine what's in between, we call it an SVT. We might be able to do vagal maneuvers for our patient, or they can even do it themselves. You know, the Valsalva maneuver or bearing down, coughing. A physician, NP or PA, 
who listens to the breweries and Annette can do a carotid massage. Uh, years ago, they used to dunk patients' heads in a bucket of cold water. Um, but now I think medications might help. So if the Valsalva maneuver doesn't work, we could try adenosine, and that's usually six milligrams, then another 12 and 12 milligrams. And we say adenosine, six, 12, 12, push it fast and flush it in. So if adenosine doesn't work, and adenosine, if you've seen it works, it's very dramatic, it causes flat line on the monitor, drops their pressure for six seconds, but their rate usually comes back up. It is a very successful drug. It's still very popular. If, but if adenosine does not work, amiodarone is next in line. Now we used amiodarone for ventricular dysrhythmias. It also works in the atrium. So that's a cool drug, amiodarone. When we talked about the V-fib patient a little while ago, we talked about 300 milligrams IV push. But based on amiodarone in a patient who has a pulse, whose blood pressure is already dropping because of tachycardia, amiodarone dose in this patient is 150 milligrams in an infusion. So we'll put 150 milligrams in 100 mLs and run it in over a 10 minute period and watch that blood pressure. So we tried vagal maneuvers, we tried adenosine, we tried amiodarone. I hope that works. American Heart would have already rather seen us get ready for cardioversion. So if one drug doesn't work, we should be able to have an adequate blood pressure still on the patient that we could sedate them, comfortably synchronize cardiovert them. So in any of these tachycardias that are not treatable by drugs, and we're worried about the patient becoming unstable, we should be ready for synchronized cardioversion. We usually start with 50 to 100 joules. Sedation with pads on the chest is preferably, biphasic equipment as well. So with SVT, we could treat it with drugs or electricity if needed. VTAC, the first thing you want to check is if there's a pulse. Now if I said that this patient has a pulse, we would hope that a drug would work. The drug for the ventricular dysrhythmia is amiodarone, the same dose, 150 milligrams in 100 mLs over 10 minutes. Now I am already have the pads on this patient's chest because from my experiences, patients in VTAC do not stay stable very long. I know it happens, they stay stable, but I'm always ready to do synchronized cardioversion, 50, 100 joules. If the cardiologist is there and asks me for 200, I'll set the machine for 200 synchronized. If I'm able to sedate this patient, I certainly would have done that already. So amiodarone, synchronized cardioversion. I say synchronized cardioversion because that will allow the energy, when I shock the patient, to be released only on the upstroke of the R wave in the cardiac complex. Of much safer spot than rather on the T wave. So, so synchronized cardioversion, we start with less joules and it's synchronized to the R wave. Safer way to shock somebody. So we tried amiodarone, synchronized cardioversion, and now we'll try to lidocaine. Lidocaine, the first dose for the average size patient is 100 milligrams. And we would probably just another synchronized cardioversion at this time and repeat with 50. And that's how we take care of all the tachycardias. We could try vagal maneuvers, we could try drugs, and in all the tachycardias, if they become unstable, chest pain, shortness of breath, change in mental status, crackles in their lungs and hypotension, we should go directly to synchronized cardioversion. And the more that we read about this and get opportunities to practice, the more comfortable you are with the equipment. Thank you.